Uh, this is from Ryan Anderson, who goes, I always have to wonder how both of you got into wrestling journalism. Do you have to have connections to become one? I don't even know how you got started, Brian. How did you get started? I did, um, back when we did uh, the backyard wrestling, there was this guy that was actually financing us for a while, and he gave me uh, money to do a newsletter about the promotion. And uh, so I did that and mailed it out every week. And as soon as that uh, that pretty much ended, I kept the newsletter going and stopped writing about us and started writing about everybody else. We've got Steve Regal on the line right now. I want to get to him right away. Steve, how are you doing today? How are you doing? All right, Dave. Yeah, we're doing we're doing good too. Um, uh, you know, uh, the last time we had you on the show, yeah. um, it was uh, the the afternoon. It was right before the Brian Pillman show. We were in Cincinnati, and you had mentioned that you felt your match with Chris Benoit was the most important match of your career. Yeah. And as and and now that it's happened and it was as, as probably as good a match as, as you could have hoped for or or what or was it um how do you feel well it definitely was the you know the biggest match of my career because it was the start of a new career you know so you know pretty much everybody had given me up including myself had given me up for dead you know so uh i had to go out and you know prove to myself more than anything that i had I could still definitely be a part of this business now. And as far as it being, was it what I hoped for? Uh, yes, I mean, I, in fact, it was far more than I hoped for. Not not the actual match, but the, the the crowd reaction was just incredible. I mean, I still can't believe how, you know, you couldn't have, you couldn't have actually, I mean, wished for any anything close to, to, to that kind of reaction from people. It was definitely something special, I, you know. I was was that, was that the highlight of your career? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, and that, that's spanning, you know, a long time and a lot of countries and a lot of things. But you know, I mean, to, uh, Reckless Youth said to me last week, the first time I saw him after that show, he, he said there was a look on your face when you got in the ring and people were already chanting your name, you, you were like looking at them like, what, what are you chanting my name kind of thing for, you know. I was expecting basically to just, you know, Steve Regal, you know, here, here we go again kind of thing. I, I don't know what I was expecting, but certainly nothing like that. So it, well, it was very special. It was really, uh, you know, I, I, it was so surprising because when you came out, you know, here, you know, you really haven't been on TV uh, we were on, on WCW, but with no push. You were on WWF at a time that you probably wish you weren't on TV. In hindsight, yeah. uh, it's been it's been years since you've been healthy, straight, you know, um, and, and on television as far as on a national basis. Yeah. I and mean, what? Oh, uh, what? I mean the, the the last decent matches that I had were were the beginning of '97, so it's been three years, you know. And 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 in this environment, three three years is is eternity. Yes. You know, because wrestling moves so quickly. And when you came out there, originally you got a real good reaction, and then, you know, you put on that, that match, and, you know, the people were chanting your name and everything like that. And there was, quite frankly, there was no reason for them to, other than Benoit, I guess, is on TV as a heel, but he's also on an independent show. A guy like Chris Benoit showing up on an independent show is like a, a superstar. So for them to take you as a, as a baby face when you really... It was interesting just because... There was no reason you hadn't worked. You hadn't worked babyface. You hadn't been on television, but I think I don't know if that they know your whole story and was just rooting for you to succeed or, or what the thing was. But it was. Um, I mean, it was. It was one of the, the great moments in wrestling this year. I thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't understand it. I wish somebody from that audience that, that was involved in that would tell me, or, or people would let me know. Why it's still. It, it was just incredible, you know. I, I had no idea, you know. And I sat there afterwards, thinking, you know, like kind of pinch yourself, kind of thing. Is this, is that really happened, you know? But just have to, you know, appreciate it for what it was. You know, it definitely was something. It, you know, if if I never wrestled again, that that it it it, it, it stopped off a, a great career that I've had. Apart from a few years, you know, but it's been a, a, a great career, and it, it was definitely the highlight. And like I say, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to starting a, a, you know, a completely new career. So it was uh, either the beginning of something good or the end of something good. When 
after after the feedback got back to the office, did you get like people from the company like sort of hearing about the match? And, and you, have you gotten talked to as far as a timetable of coming back to the World Wrestling Federation or you know a program or anything like that? I've been talked about a program, um, but uh, not an exact timetable. So I was you know I was spoken to last week about a program. So. Uh, you know exactly when it. I, I, I believe I've got to go to Raw and to SmackDown next week. So you know, if, if, if I've got to get into talks there, then hopefully it'll be soon. You know, I, uh, I'd like to obviously get into the mix of things. Now that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm real confident with my abilities, I'd really like to get back there and start doing the right thing again. You know? Now you you hit, I guess, what would be considered rock bottom. Yeah. What was the point when you hit that, and what was the motivation for you to say, this is rock bottom, I'm not going to let it get any worse, I'm I'm going to turn my life around? I got put into treatment on the 4th of January 1999, and after 10 weeks in there, I worked really hard at it, but I still wasn't getting it. You know, I still just wasn't getting it. And... I believe it was March the 13th. It's sort of like they ended up putting me in a <laughs> a lockup facility. They have a lockup facility that you're either in one part of the of the, the, the treatment centre or there's a like a, a drying out place. And I got through back in there for a week because I just was not getting it, and I was resisting everything that they threw at me. On certain levels, I was working really hard on other levels. Certain things I just wasn't getting, I wasn't buying into. And um, they sent me down there for a week, and I sat there, and, you know, my family life was just, just you know, because of my, you know, what I'd been doing was, you know, just that caused just incredible amount of damage to my family. And, you know, I basically knew that, WWF were going to let me go, but I didn't want to, you know, that happened the week after. And it was just, when I came out of there, well, while I was sat there for a week, um, just, I thought, this is it, you know, there's just no more, cannot have any ideas, you know, you have to change your complete outlook on life and, and, and the way everything is and, and just get with it and, and, and stick with it. And, because, you know, there's... You, Nowhere to go but down. I mean, they always drum that into your wire. There, there's only two things that going to happen to you if, if you don't get this, and that's jail or death. And uh, it just something hit me in there, and that was it. I, I just went through it, and, and, and I, I said, this is it. I'm going to, you know, stick it out. WWF let me go the following week, so I had no job. You know, I obviously thought, you know, nobody going to hire me. You know, I, I really thought everybody knew about what was going on. Um, and so I had no, no idea what I was going to do. But I knew as long as I stayed sober that something would come along if I had to go back to England and start all over again. I knew that I could do it. But, you know, the most important thing in my life now is to stay sober and that above anything else, above family, above anything, because without that, I don't have a family, I don't have a job, I don't have a, anything. It's just, life just was miserable, absolutely miserable. I felt dreadful all the time, it was miserable. Life was just chaos, and it was all chaos that I created. And uh, it, it just, it, that was it, you know, that's what it took for me to get. And it was incredibly difficult, you know, that that's, I was real fortunate in a way that WCW hired me back, but they didn't work me at all. I mean, they used me very, very rarely, you know. And I, I worked hard when I was there, uh, you know, uh, but my health was not good. You know, there's, when you, you stop putting all those pills into your body, your body goes into shock after a while for, for not having them. And you go through spells, and it takes a long time. I mean, some of those drugs and, uh, and alcohol or whatever it is, some, some things can be like five years in your system, you know, but 
they, they reckon about six months to 12 months, and it pretty much all comes out. Well, I'd go for a few weeks, and I'd be fine, and I'd start doing a little bit of training, and then I'd go for like a month, and I'd feel just miserable, you know, like just having a job to get out of the chair. But I, I, I just worked through it, and, and because of the... The treatment centre that WWF put me in was the best possible place they could put me. You know, they found the best place, and I had the support network with those people that I could talk to any time I, I felt if you know something didn't feel right. I could talk to them and say, right, well, we're expecting this. Okay, do this, do this, and so you know, I got through all that by, you know, I think it was like the end of October. I started feeling good again, and. Uh, I could start training a little bit, and uh, within a few months, you know, I got, by the time Christmas rolled around and that, I started feeling good again, and then, like, WCW let me go in February, and pretty much straight away, you know, I, I called, I, I was really embarrassed about calling the WWF, I like thought it's too soon, but I've got no other options, so... You know. So I, I called a few people and they said, yeah, you can come back as long as you've done the right things, which I, you know, I, I signed a deal when I left the treatment place to take random drug screens, which I call them every single day. And they, I've got like a color. And if this color comes up on a computer, I have to go and drop there within a few hours. You know, they tell me where, it doesn't matter what town I'm in, what country I'm in. They'll tell me to go. They'll, they'll find a place. They'll just, you know, say, go to this place in this town. And I have to drop, so I'd done all that through the year, you know, whatever I'd been. I, I, I took the test, so I, I showed all that. The WWF I said, yep, that's fine, you come back, go to Memphis, you know, get yourself in shape. Um, WCW obviously let me go. They said I wasn't working enough for the amount of money I was getting paid. That was the reason I, I was given, which, you know, I, it's a lot of nonsense, you know, that. I, you know, you're not booking me out. <laughs> How can you be working on the days if they, not, if they don't, they don't you, book yeah. you? But that was the excuse I was given anyway. And then yeah. the next day they tried to hire me back for less money. <laughs> oh, so that's so that was just basically to get you off contract and onto a, uh, a lower deal or something. Well, they wanted me to train people at the power plant and, and get paid a nightly deal. But, you know, I was very grateful of the job there when I needed it. And I always worked hard, excuse me, I always worked hard when I was there. And it was like, well, if I'm good enough to train people, but I'm not good enough to be on your shows all the time, you know, I, I just didn't feel right about that. And if it had been last year when I, I didn't feel good, I'd have quite happily taken that job because I, I really wasn't confident about my abilities at that time. I didn't feel healthy enough. But by then I felt good, you know, and I thought, well, you know, I know I can do this. Uh, you know, I'm only, I was 31 at the time. I thought, I've got plenty of years left. One good thing about, well, it, you know, all the chaos I caused, but one good thing about the last couple of years, the good thing that's come out of it, I've healed up. I, you know, I had a lot of injuries, but I've had a lot of time off, so I've I healed up. I, I feel great. You know, I've got no injuries, no nagging problems whatsoever. So it's, uh, I, I thought, well, I, I've, got to, I've got to take that chance. I, I've got to go to the WWF. It's the only place where there's a possibility for me because, you know, I know I've got the talent to do it. And, I'm, you know, WCW, I'm just not going to go anywhere. You know, I got to stages in my career there where I was, I was probably the, one of the best things I had at certain stages of my career there. And it just never went anywhere because you're on that cap level with money. You know, if you're not earning a, a certain amount of money, you know, that they won't give you that extra push because they can't justify paying the other guys all the extra money they're paying them. And I, I found that to be the case a lot of the time, especially in, like, the middle of 96 when I, you know, they were really using me really well. And it just sort of, they were using me real well, and then all of a sudden it was like, just throwing me you know, back down levels, and I, I kept struggling against that all the time. Obviously, the next few years was, was all my fault, but there were, there was a lot of times in there from 94 on that where it wasn't my fault, you know, and I was working hard for them and I, I was doing good work and they just didn't. So I was always, and everybody that works there knows that, you know, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know. There's always Steve, that Steve, frustration Steve. when you're there. 
We have a lot of emails here to Steve. We also have a couple of calls. I want to start with uh, Todd in Maryland. Todd, you're first up with Steve Regal. And Todd, uh, go, go ahead. Hi, Dave. Hi, Steve. How are you guys doing today? Good, thank you. Um, Steve, I just wanted to say how much respect I have you on for you on a personal level, and I just wanted to congratulate you on how far you've come because it's just a real testament considering, you know, just reading about how many things you've been through and how long of a journey it's been to see that it, you know, come out to the bright, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. Um, I, I had two questions for you. First, I was wondering if you had any um, immediate career plans or, or long-term goals. I'm sorry, Dave. I, I can very, very slightly he, hear him. Could you just repeat that, please? Yeah, he's just saying that uh, he's wondering if you. What, what are your long-term goals? Um, long-term goals in the wrestling business. Um, yeah. Just to go and do the best work that I can possibly do. You know, I mean, and and be a, a try and be a major part of anything that I'm put in, and, and and part of the WWF. You know, I mean, I also really enjoy helping people uh, you know I, i've always all the time that i spent with wcw i always went to the power plant and always helped a lot of people and i'm enjoying doing that now in memphis so anytime that you know anybody wants to pick my brains on wrestling i'm always more than happy to do that and i, I see myself moving towards that as i get older anything else todd um, yeah, I was wondering what his thoughts are um, on Davey Boy Smith. It seems like he's sort of on the wrong end of a very similar path. Um, are you, did you did, did you know Davey Boy Smith? I know you're both from England. I mean, did you ever have any meetings? I know, like he came he came over to, to Canada when you would have been very very young. But, yes. Um, uh, I, I mean, I guess you bumped into him in WCW. Yeah, we, we, we've met him a few times. Uh, my feelings, I just. You know, I, I wish him the best, and I hope he gets, you know, sorted out with whatever problems he's got, whatever they may be, you know. I mean, that, that's something that I don't get involved in other people's, you know, problems anymore. You know, people ask me, you know, would you give advice to this? To this what would you say to other wrestlers? I, I'm not giving any advice to anybody because I, I look after me. and That might sound selfish, but, you know... Take care of you, you know, take responsibilities for your own things and don't worry about blaming other people or other things for your problem or trying to give advice out. I'm just looking after me, which is, uh, you know, that, that's all I can do. So I really hope that he, you know, sorts out whatever problems he's got. As far as how hard is going back, I know a lot of, a lot of, uh, of drug issues you know, have to do with environment, and how hard is it, uh, especially if you go back on the road full-time with the WF, you know, that, that environment that you're in with the traveling and, and, you know, the ease, it's almost, you know, like when you're out there wrestling every night and traveling so much, you know, that, that, that ease to fall into that pattern and knowing you have to work so hard to, to avoid it or you're going to be in a lot of trouble. What's, you know, do you think that's, is that, is that difficult? I haven't had a problem with it at all. Not one little bit, but, you know, I really think I, I've, I've got down as far as I could possibly go. I mean, I, this is certainly not the place to talk about, you know, how low down my life was, but it, it was absolutely miserable. And when I finally realized that, you know, there's nothing that I could possibly think of that could make me go back to that life, because it was, you know, it was horrific. It was just horrendous. There's, there's no other words for it. It was, it, it was just a miserable existence. And so, you know, I, I, when I was on the road for WCW last year, it, it doesn't bother me. You know, I, I see guys do stuff. There's no way that I'm going back to that. And whatever it takes for me to keep away from that, that's, that's what I'll do. You know, I, there's, if, if I get hurt, there's plenty of medication you can take that's non-narcotic and addictive. You know, that, that's just taking responsibility for yourself. You know, I have, I have books. I carry books around with me. When I get to the WWF, I give it to the trainers there, the agents, anybody. If I get knocked out, anything, there's certain things that I cannot have. You know, you can't play around with this. Once you become addicted to one thing, it's incredibly easy to become addicted to anything that's 
has addictive properties, you know, so you can't drink alcohol, you can't, you just cannot mess with anything. And so, you know, that that's my responsibility to take, take care of that. And so, you know, I don't see there being a problem because, I, you know, that, that's, you know, I plan it all out exactly what I'm, I'm doing and, you know, I make sure that everybody knows. That's why I'm very open about this. I, I don't hide anything from anybody because nobody's got anything to come back at me with, you know. I mean, I, I, I take responsibility for everything that, that I do and, and everything that could possibly happen to me. I, I know what to do in, if that, you know, comes around, so... What, before you, you had your problems, what would you say when you look back at your career, started as a teenager? Yeah. What, 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 would, be the, what would be your high points? What are the things you're most proud of uh, as far as here, Japan, Europe, anywhere? You've been, every, you've been almost everywhere. Yeah. Um, there, there was a, a spell where a lot of the heavyweight guys in England just went from country to country. They didn't really get a lot of work in England that they went to. To Europe, and they went to all the African countries, and, and, and all over the place. And uh, there was a spell where that's what I was doing. You know, I just went from one country to the next, and and I, I was really proud of all that work because it, you know, you you were taken in. Sometimes two of you, but usually just one. Well, I would go to some place, and you dress all the local guys, all the top guys they had, you know, and you do long matches. I mean, some really long, you know, 15, five-minute round championship matches with guys that were horrible. I mean, absolutely rotten, you know. But, you know, I mean, it certainly wouldn't be able, watchable in this country nowadays, but for their style, you know, at the time, and all the kinds of moves that I do, you know, putting people in and out of moves and making them look like they can do a lot more than they can actually do, you know, you could go on with these guys and make them look great and and. and and I was always proud of doing that, those long matches and getting through them and, and leaving on a high note, you know, putting over their top guys. You know, you'd beat a couple of guys for a few weeks, say if you were there a month, and then the last night you'd make their guy, the top guy look, you know, as, as good as you could. And, and I was always proud that I was, everywhere I went, I was always asked back several times in, in, in you know, a lot of places. And I was always asked back, and I was always proud of that. As far as, you know, I, I'm not going to say anything in particular but I was always proud that I could do that and I was always proud that I was asked to do that because there was only a select few guys in England that went on those those kind of trips and that they were very close knit you know they didn't let many people into that fold and I was asked that I was like 19 when I started doing that and I was you know I really enjoyed doing that I, I came here when I was 24 for those few years you know I was always in and out of different countries and working with all the guys and all the different styles. I mean, every place you went had a different style. And, uh, you know, you got a lot of these places. I remember going to South Africa, and I thought it was going to be tremendous because all, all the guys that I really admired in England all used to go to South Africa, and I thought, oh, these guys must be great. And I got there, and I stood at the back at the first night watching the matches, and it was horrendous. They were dreadful, you know. But they were absolutely killing each other. But it looked as phony as it could possibly look. They were dropping each other on their heads and they were tripping over each other's feet, but they were killing each other. I thought, well, have I got myself into here, you know? But I was always proud that, I, you know, I could go on with their guys and make them look like, you know, as good as I could and, 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 and get asked back. So that, 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 it was all a great time for me, all that. Steve, you know, this, you were, you were, were you in England, kind of like the, during the decline of the the local British wrestling, or did you come along a little after that? And I was wondering what your thoughts are of. I know that British wrestling at one point, you know, was really, really big on television, yes. and then it kind of uh, died out until the WWF, you know, really got strong. Wrestling was, I wouldn't say dead, but it was at a very low level in England for many years. Yeah, um, I started. In 1983, I had my first matches. I was just 15 then, but like 16 and 17, I just worked on the independent level in England. When I was 18, I got my first break with Dale Martins, which was a TV company. Um, and I went to work for them, and after three months, I quit. <laughs> because I kept, 
I, I did a couple of TV matches, then they started putting me in the, if anybody knows what I'm talking about, I know how bad it was, in, in, in the Big Daddy tag matches. And I was yeah. Big Daddy's partner, and I was on with, you know, Giant Haystacks, always some other villain, you know, and it was rough, you know, and I, I, I was, I really wanted to learn this, because I, I spent a lot of years not, not learning anything. I was on with a lot of guys that, you know, that, all I did basically was hold on to them and they put themselves in and out of a load of moves, but they never actually showed me how to do that. So I was just like, I might as well have not been there, you know, they could have done that with a, a broomstick or something, you know. And I really wanted to learn this and I, I quit the company. And about that time that I quit, Brian Dixon, who was the other big promoter in England, got half of the TV shows. So one week it'd be Dale Martins, one week. And then not long after that, it all folded. I think it was 88 when it folded. And what, what exactly happened, there's a guy called Greg Dyke, who was in charge of ITV at the time. And he came along and decided that wrestling was too working class. And all the comedy shows that were on in England and all the sports that working class people like, which is the majority of the people there, he decided that he didn't want that. He wanted, And he started showing, like, American football, you know, and stuff that, 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 you know, that's great here, but nobody in England understood it, you know. We'd, we'd never seen it and, 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 and like, stopped all the, the games that people liked and take, took rugby off TV and, and stuff and decided wrestling was too working class. And so the first thing he did to try and get rid of it, he, moved, he used to have a 4 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon a spot every week for years. And it used to draw big, big ratings. And he moved it to 12 o'clock, well... 12 noon. Everybody in England, pretty much everybody that has a job works Saturday, half day. It's just the way it is over there. So that cut the viewing figures straight away to about a third within within like two weeks of it changing to, to 12 noon. And within a few months of it being like that, him being in charge, went to the company bosses and said, look, this wrestling is not drawing and took it off TV. And there was absolute, I mean, uproars in England. Absolute uproars, but it didn't affect me in any way whatsoever. I mean, it killed a lot of people's careers. It, it didn't affect me. I, I think I was only on TV about six times. And then, you know, like, it just killed guys. I mean, guys that were working every single night and the household business died off. And guys that were working all the time we just had to get regular jobs. And I mean, there was a stage where, you know, you could work every night of the week and... and, and you know, six, seven nights a week, and it was down to two and three jobs a week, and then to one job a week, and and it just got really bad. But after a while, I think it was around about 89 or beginning of 90, it started to pick up just on house show business. I was working in and out of the country, but I was also working for Brian Dixon, and he just put on tremendous shows. It like top of the bill would be Dave Taylor against Vic Finley, and you know, Danny Boy Collins against whoever, you know, and it they're just really good shows here, and he had a lot, lot of real good talent with some great wrestlers there, and we just kept working and working, and we built all the business up, and it went real well for a while, and then they killed it all off, I mean, and uh, what exactly happened with that, they killed it again, was they started putting on, like, fake American shows, they started having guys dressing up like the Road Warriors and they'd have like a fake Undertaker and a, everything. And there was these guys that weren't any good, you know, and they were going around to all the buildings that we did regularly with this show these, and, and building it as American wrestling and all it. And so once people went and saw these people and realized that, you know, they'd be cheated, they just didn't go back. So it killed all the business off again. And it was about that time that, that I think like 93, I was away. I'm no, sorry, 92, I was away for nine months, the whole year, basically. I was away, and, and, and in that nine months, I mean, it basically killed all the business right down. But luckily for me, the next year, I, you know, January, I came to America, so it really didn't affect me. But it, it just killed a lot of guys' careers. I mean, my best friend, Robbie Brookside, he was a tremendous talent. Danny Boy Collins, a lot of guys that were really talented guys just ended up with no work, you know, and they all had to get jobs and different things. It, it was a bad time. Brian, any any questions you got for Steve? Yeah, I was wondering, um, were you trained by your grandfather? 
No, I wasn't. My grandfather was a wrestler, but I wasn't trained by him. I mean, he used to tell me different things, but my grandfather basically just worked on um, carnivals. You know, he was a he wrestled and he boxed and whatever he had to do. You know, he'd fight, he'd bare knuckle fight or whatever he had to do. You know, to make some money. But I, he, he was quite old when I started. He was, uh, I believe, he was 80 when I started wrestling. So now I was. Did you do carnival wrestling? Yes. Point? Yes, that's how I started. That's right. That's right. You told me. That. What's What's it like as far as uh, mentally, you know, fighting people who, gen I guess, generally wouldn't know wrestling, but you also don't know what to make of them because you don't know what they're going to do. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, um, you know, you only. Kept, he kept as many people out as possible. He obviously had plants, you know, that he worked in the crowd. But sometimes you, you couldn't avoid people. And a lot of the fighting that went on was guys jumping in the ring. You know, they get carried away with it. They'd all been out drinking beer all day, you know, walking around. And, and they'd see somebody who they thought was, you know, probably somebody you were working with, thought that they were... Um, you know, getting beaten up and they'd jump in the ring from behind. It, it was it was very, very dangerous place to be. There was a lot of very, very violent place to be. But to actually take on a straight, you know, a, a, a straight person was nerve-wracking because you had no idea. And, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to hold my hand up to say that if I thought that there was a chance of them beating me, I used to take some really bad liberties with people. It's, they were bigger, you know, or just looked like that they were dangerous. As soon as the head came between the top and middle rope, you know, I used to boot them straight in the face and just drag them in and, you know, did what I had to do because it, it there wasn't a lot of money there and it was a dangerous way of making a living. There's, there's something, before we get to a cause, I got this email that, actually, uh, that I was interested in. Is, what is your opinion as far as the guys that you're down in Memphis with, the younger guys like K-Crush and, and Reckless Youth, what are your opinion of those guys? K-Crush has, has, has got so much personality and talent. It, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, he's just got everything that you could possibly want. He works hard, you know, and, and not only the talent-wise, I mean, just as a real nice guy works hard. The same with Reckless Youth, you know, like... K-Crush has got a great look. Reckless, uh, you know... I, if they just find the right look for him, he's got everything they need, you know. I mean, that, the way I see him and the way I see him, you know, I've worked with him a lot. I see him, I know WWF don't like mass men, but I see him being a kind of a Tiger Mask deal, you know. Not exactly Tiger Mask, but, you know, that to me, just one guy in the company that did it and did it right and can do the kind of moves that he can do in the right kind of outfit to work with Dean and to work with, you know, the, the other light heavyweights would be tremendous. And because you just need that right look or, or, or something else. But that's what I see when I when I see him all the time. Because he just studies Tiger Mask, you know, all the time. He's always watching him. And, and I, I, I see that in him, just having the right look. But they, they've both got, you know, a lot of work ethic and a lot of talent. How about, uh, how about anybody else there that really impresses you? Um... I'm working with the posse at the moment, and you know that they're getting better. I see a lot of talent in Joey Abs, a lot of talent, you know. And, and the other two guys, Pete and Rodney, work really, really hard. You know, I mean, they really do put a lot of effort in, a lot of extra effort. So, but they've only been there. I've only been working with them a few weeks, so I can't really say much apart from you know they really work hard, all three of them. And there's really nobody else. Meanie was there for a while, and. You know, I mean, he dropped a lot of weight, and he was, you know, he, he, his work ethic was great. That, that's about it, really. I was supposed to get some uh, new guys next week that are coming from Shawn Michaels' uh, school, which I believe are, you know, are, are very, very good, so that'll be great. You know, and I'm sure they've got a tremendous work ethic. I, I'm sure, you know, I don't know Shawn. I've only met him a few times, but... You know, as good as he is, I'm sure he wouldn't let them come out of his school if they, if they weren't really good, because, you know, his name's on them. So I'm looking forward to seeing those guys, you know, and working with them. Let's go to Mike in Illinois. Mike, you're next up. Yeah, hi, Dave. Hi, uh, and hello, Mr. Regal. Hello. 
Um, I was wondering. I was wondering. Um, weren't you teamed up with Tiger Ali Singh for a while down in Memphis? I'm trying to. I, 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 maybe I maybe I read something wrong, but uh... was Tiger Ali Singh in Memphis? No. No, 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 no. He went. I think Tiger Ali Singh got sent to Puerto Rico. I think he's talking about Ali. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Did you? Yeah, he. Well, Ali, no, Ali worked on the other promotion in Memphis, though. He worked for um for Randy Hales. Yeah, he doesn't work. For... Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I, uh, because I I must have re uh, read something wrong then. It might uh, be uh um um Steve Bradley. Mm -hmm. And Tiger Ali Singh working together in in Puerto Rico. Well, I believe that's it. I, I, I think I've read that. Two of those back together. Okay. Um, the question I had was, um, you, you know, one thing we always hear about Japan and Mexico, but I, re you know, you rarely hear about like um, wrestling in Africa or in Asia besides uh, Japan. And I was wondering, did you ever wrestle um, like in like uh, in India or Malaysia around there, or do you know uh, if? Uh, uh, what type of wrestling events happen in those countries? I've wrestled in India. Um, I've wrestled in South Africa mm -hmm. and in Egypt. Um, did you I, wrestle um, on, on like in, in Egypt and India? Was that local wrestlers, or did you yeah. wrestle like on tour? No, oh, I've, never, so I've never been on tour with with anybody. You mm -hmm. know, like I say, apart from since I've been in this country, it was always wrestling the local promotions and, and wrestling the local wrestlers. Um, how were how were the local wrestlers and what type of style did they do in um, you talk about South Africa but in India right. and uh, you know Egypt? Well, uh, <laughs> the Indians were uh, their national sports wrestling, and uh, there were some real good guys and some real bad guys. You know, as, as there is in any any company around the world, um, just a, a lot of uh, a lot of. You know, grappling, that they just like to grab a hold and try and throw you as many times as they can and, you know, show how strong they are. And there's some real good wrestlers. I wrestled a guy there who, he was a policeman in, in uh, New Delhi and he won a silver medal in the 84 Olympics. Mm -hmm. I really can't remember his name. But he, he was really good. I, I, I think I did eight, eight, five minute round match with him. It was, it was really good. Um, and then, uh, Dara Singh, who was the big star in India, uh, he was just a promoter when I was there. He was retired from wrestling. I wrestled his ne nephew, which I believe was Baljit, Baljit Singh. And he was very good. I believe he lives in Los Angeles. And I had some real good matches with him. With some of the local wrestlers, you know, which were very good. But it, I don't think that's anybody's fault because they just never work. You know, they only work so many months of the year and they only work you know that they'll work like a couple of times a week you know for like four months of the year so you know some like myself you know it took me I was nearly three years in this business before I had anywhere close to a clue and I was working every single day you know you just uh, some people take time you know I was one of those people I didn't have any natural ability for this I didn't have talent and I, I just doing it you know, over and over and over again, and watching a lot of people and asking them to help me, you know, you learn. So a lot of guys, you, you know, people knock some people. You know, you've got to give them chance because, you know, with the amount of time that, I, you know, I've had, that, that's the unfortunate thing. I tell a lot of guys that I've been working with, I used to tell them about the that's the sad thing about today. Unless you come in with, you know, bundles of natural talent, uh -huh. You get blown away straight away. People think you, you know, you're no good. You know, some people need time to, you know, to, to get good. There's a lot of good guys out there that don't get the chance because they might be on the verge of it, but just because they can't perform on that single day, or they're not, you know, what people expect when they first see them, they get pushed to one side. Mm -hmm. But that's just the way the business is now. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, Anything else, Mike? Yeah, yeah. Just one, uh, one, uh, two real quick questions. Um, the one for uh, Mr. Rigo, uh, did you tr did you tr uh, train Kurt Angle? Did you help train Kurt Kurt Angle? Because I'm hoping w if, when you get the call up to WWF that you have a match with him because I really would like to see that match. And uh, one for you, Dave, as far as 
Is the Kurt Angle, Triple H, Stephanie Angle, is that going to be something that's going to be a slowly developing angle or something that they want to open up real fast within the next few months, within, like, let's say, SummerSlam, you know? I, I don't. I mean, it's been because they started it like uh, right at the beginning of the year, and they seemed like they t completely dropped it, and now you know last night they're picking back up on it. So, what? Do I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. No one's really said anything. Mm -hmm. You know, as as far as it, it doesn't look like it's something imminent, but it certainly looks like, you know, like uh, the, eventually, you know, I guess Helmsley and Stephanie have to uh, split up, and I guess that he's going to be the reason when they do so, and and uh, that'll be his catalyst to being, you know, in that. Uh, and yeah, that's maybe, maybe 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 Helmsley will be a baby face by then, and, and Angle will be the heel. I don't know. I don't know where they're going with it. But that's you don't it. know if it's it's like you know something that we'll see in the next few months or something like let's say WrestleMania. Oh, I don't know. I don't even think that they know as far as like a, a timetable of it. I think it's kind of uh -huh. like whenever you know whenever you know it's 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 there, and then whenever the time is right. I mean, they got Helmsley with so many different guys mm -hmm. that they're going to go through, and I think that when when they feel that. I'm, I'm guessing it's when they feel it's time to turn Helmsley. Uh, the Baby. fact maybe yeah. that maybe that'll be the you know the heel that he goes with first, and, and Helmsley will be so strong that he'll get Angle up into that spot. That you know, mm -hmm. it's always good to have another guy in that in that in that top echelon. That's yeah. gonna be tough though, because it's almost like the fans want to see those two get together, and uh, I don't know. I almost think if uh, Angle stole Stephanie, he'd be the babyface in it. I don't think how so. <laughs> the way they, she gets almost like a, 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 as good of a heel, you know, um, response as you know Triple H at times. I, I I watch the show and I just see the people wanting to you know wanting to cheer Triple H, and uh -huh. I think that uh, you know the whole thing is they keep him against the guys that that, that they won't cheer him against, but I think that they're ready for it, and I think Angle, you know, I, I think Angle's going to be on top as a heel before the day comes. Uh, you know, you may be right though. I mean, who? You know, this stuff isn't this stuff isn't like planned in a book for six months or anything like that. It's like whatever the fans kind of dictate is kind of where it winds up. As far as my question goes, um, no, I didn't train him. I'd love to take credit for it because he's incredibly talented. But no, I, I've nothing. I've never helped train him at all. Well, I hope I see that match real soon, and I hope, especially from hearing the reports from the film event about. You, you and Benoit having the match of the year so far. You know, um, I hope to really see you real soon. You one of my favorite wrestlers when you were in WCW. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot Steve, for having me on. Steve, Steve, you know, we we talked a bit about this yesterday. What um, besides Benoit, are, are there if you had to name three, four opponents in WWF that you would really that you would really look forward to wrestling and why, and who would who would they be? I'd really like to wrestle Eddie. I'd really like to wrestle Triple H because me and him used to train together a lot in WCW. And, uh, you know, I mean, he, he was a great person to be around and uh, he just soaked up everything I used to show him, you know, he could just do it. And, uh, you could see another side to him, you know, that you, you don't see because, you know, we could change stuff up and do a lot more of my stuff. and. Because and, and, he, he can do basically most of the stuff that I can, so I'd really like to, to do that. There's not many people up there I wouldn't like to work with, to be honest. In fact, you know, they've got such a great amount of talent up there. I've never worked with Perry. I, I, I've trained with him at the power plant, but I've never worked with him. And, and I, I think I, I could have some really good matches with him. Obviously, I like working with Dean. I always have good matches with him, so... And I, I'd, I'd really like to work with those Hardy boys. I think they're just tremendous. After watching those matches last night, you know, they had uh, Chris had the, the Jeff. It's really, really good. Enjoyed that. With the uh, with the uh, Helmsley, you know, when when you he was sort of like your understudy in WCW when he was uh, was John Paul Levesque. Well, we used to uh, tag together for a while. We would tag together. We were like the original Blue Bloods for about a month. Right. Yeah, that's when he went. You know. And uh, what's what's your thoughts on him becoming, you know, right at right at the just about the top guy in the business right now? From you know, and, and not all that many years. It was what was it five six six years ago maybe when this was when you were teaming with him. Yes, I couldn't be any happier for anybody because he really is one of the nicest people I've ever been around in this business. 
you know, I, I get on great with him. He was, you know, he used to come to my house, and you know, he was just a real great person to be around. And like I say, you know, I, I always knew that he had something special, and I always knew that he, you know, and I told him this at the time that he. He's one of those guys that needed to work every night, and he just wouldn't have had that chance in WCW at the time. We wasn't working that much, and you know, it, I mean, it, it's obviously been the greatest thing that ever happened to him going to the WWF. If he'd have stayed in WCW, he would have been became, you know, great. The, the, you know, you know how it goes there. You know, you, you just you start off on a certain amount of money, and you just never seem to get much above that. You know. And he would have been held back. I, I believe that anyway. It doesn't matter how talented you know you are. It, at the time, he wouldn't have got the you know his rightful spot. And yeah, I, I just I couldn't be any happy for anybody. I really couldn't because he certainly deserves. It. He's worked really hard. Okay, guys, it's time for WF Daily Trivia. Here's today's question: Who were the participants in the first ever ladder match in the World Wrestling Federation? Brian, you got that one? Mm. Let me think about it. Okay. Uh, let's. We got Steve Regal here, along of course Brian Alvarez always here. Uh, we're gonna go to uh, Dusty in Nebraska. Dusty, you're next up with Steve Regal. Hey, what's up? Uh, Not too much. I, I, just, I just want to ask Steve about his shoot, or I don't know if it's a shoot or not, but him and Goldberg back on Nitro a year or two ago. What hey, we, also that. Few, we also we've got a few emails about it. Steve, what, what, could you describe the match? You had a match <laughs> okay. with Goldberg a couple of years back. Oh, dear. I've had to explain this a few times. This is exactly what happened. Before the match, me and Bill were stood together, and one of the agents that still works for WCW now, so I won't mention his name, stood with us and told us exactly how to do that match. Exactly how to do it. Now, Bill Goldberg will tell you the same story. At the time, I don't think Bill had a match over about two minutes, and this what was what was between six and seven, I believe. They told us exactly what to do, exactly how to do it. So we went in there and we started it off. And there came a few times in there where, you know, it was nobody's fault, but Bill just, you know, forgot what he was doing. So I was trying to, you know, you know, you can't, I can't hit myself. So I was having to grab him until he, he figured out what he was doing. And, and, you know, I was hitting him and doing whatever. But I, I was, we were told exactly what to do. I came out of the ring, you know, he didn't have a problem with it. He said, I'm sorry, you know, he said, I just forgot a certain thing. And Eric Bischoff went ballistic at me. He said, I'd eaten him up and done this and done that. In the presence of this certain road agent, and I was waiting for him to, he was actually sat looking at a piece of paper. I was waiting for him to look up from the piece of paper and said, you know, own up to it. You know, I, I told him to do this, to do it this way. It's basically what Eric wanted was him to go in and, and, and squash me, which would have been fine with me, but, you know, the agent laid it out, look, this is a longer match, we need you to do this, this, this. And so then the agent never looked up from his piece of paper. And so I'm not sure if that led to me getting fired, but I was let go within, I think, about six weeks later, so... That's the story there. It was certainly nothing, me trying to prove anything to Bill Goldberg or to anybody else, which has been, you know, said time and time again, but that's not the case. So there we go. Anything else, Dustin? Uh, Dustin? Well, I was also wondering, do you, is there any chance that you know what your gimmick's going to be back, gonna be when you get back in the WWF, if you're going to keep the man's man gimmick, or is there any chance of you getting Jesus to come and manage you? I certainly bloody hope not. <laughs> Jeeves, oh, God. No, I, I, I don't think so, no. Uh, All right, well, thanks a lot. I was just looking forward what to were your, uh, sometimes. You're going to steal my question. Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> what were your first thoughts when they gave you that gimmick? That song. To be honest with you, I, I was so screwed up at the time. My mind was, so, you know, just so messed up. I, I just, you know did whatever they wanted me to do, you know. <laughs> so yeah. That song. I can oh, still... <laughs> that, that, you know, it's funny, but... You'll never forget. All the stuff that I've done in WCW and, and whatever, people 
The only thing I can remember for is that stupid song. People at, at shows now in the, you know, in the middle of Arkansas and Mississippi start singing that stupid song. <laughs> it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. It's like the biggest wind-up of all time. You know, I mean, you can close your eyes at night and you can hear that stupid song going in the background. Like, it's, I don't know, it's going to come back. So that, that's, I just laugh about it because I know, you know, there's, no question that that song is going to come back to haunt me in some some respect somewhere. So it's gonna it's gonna be your red rooster. Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> they haven't put on the WWF CD yet. <laughs> just as a novelty. <laughs> it's just like it was, there's two things in my life that are going to come back to. Well, three things. I'm making sure that one of them can't haunt me, and that's the drug problem. But that song's going to haunt me. And then when, when I was <laughs> when I was younger. You know, when I was 16 or 17, we used to do all these independent shows in England, and a friend of mine had, had, had this video camera, which were quite a novelty back in the early, you know, mid-80s. And we used to do, film these shows, and we'd be backstage at these, um, you know, places we were working at, you know, just a few people there. And was, in, in between times, we'd be doing these interviews on tape, and I know he's got every single one of these, and they're rot. Again, just absolutely rot. And I know he's going to... He, this guy he used to wrestle with me, but he makes tapes basically for a living. He, whatever, you know, any kinds of tapes, that's what he does. He pirates tapes and stuff, the guy used to work with in England. And I know he's going to start putting them out there. If anything comes up, he'll start getting them out there on the tape market. So I know these are going to come back to haunt me. So I'm expecting that at any time. He'll probably put the backing track up with that stupid song he'll have them <laughs> So they'll be hot property on the internet, I'm sure. <laughs> There's one thing, I got this from Hutch Hoskins. I want to read this. Um, this has to do with what we were talking about earlier in the show. And he said he'd like to hear from somebody at the show. This is the show in Cincinnati about the response. So he goes, I thought I'd give him you know, my two cents. I followed Steve's career for the last six or seven years. I heard all the stories, heard him talk about his problems. I remember seeing a WCW pay-per-view match with Ultimo Dragon and with Steve that was really good, so that made it even worse that a guy with so much talent and so many problems seeing him fall apart before our eyes really hurt me as a wrestling fan, as a human being. And after hearing the main event for the Pillman Show had been made Chris Benoit versus Steve Regal, I initially didn't know what to think. I wasn't sure which Steve Regal we would see. I had been hearing reports of how Steve Regal was in great condition and focused on turning his life around. At that moment, I was ready to see the match, which, which would signify, signify the return of Steve Regal. That was a show that had a lot of smart fans, and I think we all felt the same way. Our excitement about seeing Steve Regal uh, brought all the fans who didn't know the Regal story into the match. The great, fan re the great fan reaction and the superb quality of the match made it a very special night for everyone involved. So, anyway, that's what he said. You know, what can you say? You know, I mean, people, it's uh, when, when people actually, you get that used to people knocking everything that, whatever you do, you know, people, but there are people out there that still appreciate talent, you know, and uh, it's nice to hear. Before we get to the calls, I want to read this one for Brian, actually. This is from Chris Cassidy. It says, nothing to do with Steve Regal at all, but uh, lost in all the frenzy over the earth-shattering Bill Goldberg turn is the fact that the real surprise was last night on Nitro, but it was not properly addressed due to a rare production glitch. In a move that promises to change the landscape of professional wrestling forever, D'Lo Brown's chest protector has signed a three-year big-money contract with World Championship Wrestling. As you saw last night, said Eric Bischoff, WCW's executive <laughs> Russo babysitter. Oh, God. The deal is signed, sealed, and delivered, and there is nothing that Vince McMahon can do about it. The chest protector was noticeably absent from WF television for the last several months, but nobody expected something of this magnitude to happen. Asked what impact he expects a chest protector to, ma to make, Bischoff said, why don't you ask Ric Flair? Bischoff continued, look at the impact Chesty has already made already. No talent Ric Flair is gone. Who knows what, what else could make this happen? Said Vince Russo, the god among men. This is what makes WCW great. This came out of left field. It shocked everyone. When I was on WCW Live after the show, nobody could believe the reaction of the fans, and it's what everyone in wrestling is talking about. So anyway. I got a question, by the way. How old is your uh, girlfriend's son? My or her, uh, not her son, brother. My girlfriend doesn't. My girlfriend, I, my girlfriend has brothers that are 17 and uh, 12. In fact, one of them is listening to the show right now. Okay, I have a question about. You might want to ask her this. Would she ever trust her 12-year-old to Scott Steiner? <laughs> <laughs> He's the kind of guy I'd like babysitting for me, you know. <laughs> and he, what a terrible job. He's just like, okay. Hey, where's the kid at? 
Oh, yeah. He let, he let some girl yeah, just yeah, watch two, him. Two, two slappers then he walked walk, away. Two slappers and, come walking along with no clothes. And here, son, go and play with them for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Kevin Nash is, did not do his parenting skills any justice no. <laughs> last night. No. So I'm just Naming... going, go, in the, go in the room with the slappers. There's a box of cigarettes on there and a couple of pounds of crack. <laughs> just help yourself. You know. <laughs> Yeah, oh, everyone. Yeah. But everyone noticed the name of that of that nephew too, Hunter, uh-huh. Hunter. Yeah. Uh-huh. So anyway, you know, at least it wasn't Pat or Gerald. What happened to the uh, Harris twins? What? What happened to the Harris twins? They became the Harris twins. Uh, they just haven't been on TV for the last couple weeks. I don't know. They're, they're. I guess they're around. I don't know. Yeah. So you watched that show last night, Steve? I watched this first hour. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And then you switch. Then you switched over. Switch over to the proper show, yeah. What did uh, What do you think of the Jericho match with Helmsley? Very good. Um, the whole show's good, isn't it? You know, it's just you know, I, I don't know. I, I just like. I, I think the show's tremendous. I like that there's so much wrestling on the show and all the stories. That everything means something. And, you know, what, what can you say? You know, guys work so hard, and everybody puts effort in, and I, I, I just really like it. I'm not just saying that because I'm an employee there. I, you know, I, you know, I don't want to go on and rant about WCW, but what you know, a lot of people don't give any credit for was when w, when Nitro was really good. You know, they always put all the. the the stock in the fact that the last 20 minutes was NWO. They forget about all the times that there was all the great matches on that, that kept people interested for the first hour and 30 minutes, which was all good wrestling matches. For a while, they had, you know, there was a lot of great matches. Dean would always be in a great match. Chris had always been a match. Eddie would be in one. I was doing some good work at the time. You know, and it, people forget about that, you know, and put all stock in what happens at the end. But you've got to keep people interested for that. That, you know that throughout the show, and uh, I mean that, that everything on WWF is just just great. You know they just do everything real well. So you hold on just a second. We've got um, Al. Al, real quick, could you tell us who won the uh, WWF trivia question? Sure. It was Alan Smolik of Illinois and Lenny Thomas of Florida. Yeah, the first uh, ladder match. Was, Brent Sean. Um, Brent, you got it, Brent and Sean. That's right. On a was on a Coliseum video match, right? I have that tape. Yeah. How was that match? Yeah, it was all right. Huh? It was nowhere near the level of, like, Shawn Michaels and Scott Hall or anything like that. Yeah. About eight minutes. Uh-huh. Um, let's, we're going to ask Steve. This, this is an email here. Uh, at one point, I guess, that there was a plan of uh, you being part of the Four Horsemen. Uh, how did how did that come about, and how did that not come about, I guess? Oh, I, I was... I think I'm, about five or six times I was going to be in, in the Four Horsemen, I... I never got an answer why I wasn't. There was, you know, there was all kinds of times I was supposed to be in it, and, and then I wasn't. And I really don't know. I, I really no idea exactly how, how, how any of it panned out. But there was several times that I was told I was going to be in there. They were going to work me into it somehow. But I don't know. The, the, the last time I believe was the last time I won the, the TV belt. And. They told me to start holding my fingers up, you know, because I've won it four times at the, the you know, horseman deal. But that, that, you know, went nowhere. So I really don't know. I got, I got a question for you because when you brought up your, the WCW days when they were doing so well in the ratings, it reminded me that you did a quick program, actually uh, several month long, a couple pay per view matches and stuff with Rey Mysterio Jr. Yes. And what was it like? I mean, he's so talented, but he's also, you know, so much smaller than you. I suggested that. Because nobody else wanted to work with him. When he came, everybody, oh, he's too small, he's too small. You know, and I hate that. I hate when guys talk about people being a certain size in this business. Because some of the greatest wrestlers I've ever seen haven't been, you know, big guys. But if the talent's there, they, they can work with anybody. You know, if the, if the, the guys are willing to work with them. And I, nobody would work with him. You know, he was just on with, with other other Mexicans. Uh, uh, he, he was on with Dean, but none of the, uh, the bigger guys had worked with him. And, and so I said, I, I work with him, you know. I, and a lot of people knocked it, but 
you know, it, it had a purpose. I was trying to prove a point that you can go out and have good matches with this guy. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I really liked working with him. I worked with him quite a bit on the house shows and that. Went to Germany and we worked a lot on it. I always really enjoyed working with him. And after a while, especially on the house shows, because we had, you know, we started and you've not got that pressure on you to, to do a, a quick match or whatever it was. We, we could do a lot more creative stuff, or we started doing more. After the, the TV matches, like, finished, but then we had, a, like, a run together working on shows. And so we started, you know, that's when the best work came in, because we started making the best of each other's stuff once we got used to each other. And uh, I really enjoyed it, you know. I mean, he's, he's so talented and so good. How can you not, you know? And I, I, all of a sudden, after I worked with him, and then everybody else started wanting to work with him, you know. Do you think? Uh, do you think that that um, as far as the Mexican guys that were there, that WCW missed the boat, or do you think that it was just something that wasn't going to make it in this country? I think they missed the boat big time. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot. There was guys, you know. Um, there was uh, Ray and Engelbert, even uh, too, and. Um, uh, psychosis. They, they were just quality guys, you know, who could work with anybody. And, uh, you know, I, I used to really like working with psychosis. And, uh, I, I don't know, I, I can't see. I, I could never see. I, I sit back and I used to say, why, why don't they see what I see? And again, I, I look at some of the guys that, that, you know, they were using at the time. And, I, and, and, and it's the same with guys, you know, you, sitting there, guys talking, how great they think they are, and I think, well, do they not watch what I watch? Do they watch themselves <laughs> on TV and, and think that what they do is good, or... I, I, I don't know, and I could never understand what people saw in it. Because, I, you know, I, you not watch those guys and see that there's, there's unlimited things you can do with them. I can understand with some of the guys, because, they, you know, they were very much set in... In, in, you know, in the, in the right arm and right leg thing, and they, they couldn't really adjust, you know. And you can understand that. But, you know, guys like that, that they could work, you know, American style and, 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 and do what needed to be done. I, I just, I, I didn't, didn't quite get it. And again, don't quite get a lot of things, you know. Our next question here, this is from A. Anton, and it was asking you if you ever fought in uh, Greece and have you ever done any kind of pancreation style or shoot style uh, competitive wrestling? No, I haven't. Uh, I never. I've been. To, I've been on holiday to Crete once, but um, no, I haven't. Oh, I'm okay. just thinking, listening to those commercials. Then you need to give that Marcus Bagwell the number for Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> if he gets any further back, he'll be combing his ass, won't he? <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, this is someone who was asking, uh, what were your thoughts of Hector Garza? I remember you worked with him once on a, on a TV match when he first came in. Yeah, um, we didn't really get a chance to, you know, do a great deal. It was just a real quick match, as I believe. In fact, if I remember rightly, it was about four minutes. So we didn't really get a chance to, you know, I used to love watching him when he worked in those, you know, the Lucha six months. I used to think they were great, you know. Um, but, you know, he, he wasn't there that, that, so much, was he? You know, he just he used to come in to do those, and then he was off for a long time, and I never really saw him after that, you know. But obviously got a lot of talent, you know. Well, um, this, How close this are you uh, with Fit Finlay? Excuse me? Fit Finlay? What about him? How close are you to him? I remember you guys had some awesome matches. It was like that parking lot brawl. The parking that. lot brawl, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then he ended up getting injured. Just wondering if you talked to him, you know. Yeah, actually, I spoke to him today. He lives just a couple of miles down the road from me. Um, you know, people have never seen how really great Pitt Finley is in this country. You know, he hasn't had the, the opportunity to show that. Pitt Finley's probably my favorite wrestler that I've, I've ever seen. It, it, you know, I, I've watched his matches. He used to do the best. Doesn't matter who he worked with, it they always had the best match with him. Pretty similar to Chris Benoit now. Doesn't matter who Chris works with, they get the Chris gets the best match out of that that opponent. You know, 
that Finley used to make everybody fight for everything they got. So they had the, you either you either had the greatest match you had or he'd just eat you alive. And it, but it, most people it brought out something in them. You know, I, I used to just sit in awe just watching him. It, he used, matches he used to have in England and then when you go to Germany and they'd do, you know, great big long championship matches. I saw Eddie Gilbert came over two times in 92 when I was there. For Otto Lanta and did different championships with him, and they were just phenomenal, you know. I mean, really long matches. I don't know, 12, 15 rounds, maybe, you know. I mean, just non stop, up and down. Uh, it was, I mean, if you can ever get any tapes from, you know, those long matches you used to do with those, it just incredible. From the early 80s, the, the TV matches he did in England, I mean, it was just, just phenomenal, you know. It was just. I love that. Guys that move around real good and work real solid and, and believable. And, you know, he's just great. Just a shame he's never been really used. Right. I mean, were you were you um, a fan watching during, like, the, uh, I don't know, the era in British wrestling where, like, uh, Mark Roller, Ball Rocker, those type of guys, oh, yeah. Marty Jones? Oh, yeah. Well, Marty Jones was, I met Marty when I was 18, and he took me under his wing and trained me from there onwards. And... Oh yeah, they, they were the, just the greatest. That was the best time to be a wrestling fan. It was like the, the late 70s and, and early 80s in England. It, like uh, Tiger Mass was there, Sammy Lee, and Rocco was there, and, and Marty, and occasionally Dynamite had come in. And you know, these guys worked together. Just unbelievable, you know. They, 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 like, you know, you'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but they changed the, the, the scope of wrestling, you know, the shape of wrestling, because they'd all been to Mexico, they'd all, most of them, been to Japan, Cal, they'd all been to Calgary, and they all had the British style, and they just mixed it all together, and they, they put all the best bits of everything together, and made a real credible, you know, hard-hitting, flying-around kind of style, you know, with lots of crazy bumps, and, it, 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 you know, the, like the guys like Eddie and and... and uh, Chris that do that style nowadays. I mean, that, that's but as far as I know, anyway, that that's where it stemmed from. And I, I used to watch that when I was a kid. Just, just incredible, absolutely incredible. Every Saturday afternoon, you used to turn on TV four o'clock, and there'd be one of those kind of, you know, they didn't change the four guys, you know, and that sometimes we something they just always oh, incredible matches, you know, and. Uh, they all went separate ways, like Sam went back and became Tiger Mask, and then, you know, Rocco was Black Tiger, and Marty pretty much stayed in England, and uh, Dynamite obviously went on to, to the great things he went on to. I used to I used to go and watch Dynamite when I was seven years old. He was 16. I used to go and watch him, you know, actually live. I mean, imagine that when he, you know, a little kid wanting to be a wrestler. I mean, I always knew from being about five years old I wanted to be a wrestler when you seven years old watching you know never seen anything like it just a lot of what I used to think was all men in England you know a lot of them weren't but you know somebody that was you know was like the absolute hero you know I mean a 16 year old kid just looked like the kid that used to know used to go to school and there he is you know flying around and doing all this great stuff incredible uh, let's go to, let's go to Adam in Brooklyn Adam you're oh. up with Steve Regal hey Steve I, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of you. I liked your ma I loved your matches like uh, Larry Zbysko and Mark Marrow and Ricky Steamboat. But I was wondering, um, like, I remember there was an incident a few years ago in the WWF where you faced um, T John Tenta, who was Golga at the time. And, like, I, I remember they, like, uh, had to edit the show out of the mat, uh, edit the match out of one of the shows because um, something happened, like his mask fell off or something like that. Uh, I was wondering if you know anything about it. I'll be quite honest with you. I mean, I vaguely remember it. But at that time, you know, my whole life was it was totally a mess, and it was all my fault. You know, nobody's to blame for it but me. And uh, what I believed that was, I bent him down to give him an uppercut because I had to, you know, he's a lot taller than me, and I bent him down, and the mask just came off in my hand. And I, 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 you know, he, he, he was really mad. And he, I think he thought I did it on purpose, but I actually didn't. But, you know, I mean, the way I was at the time, I don't blame anybody thinking that, you know, because I was in a bad state. But, you know, that, that's what I, 
as far as I can remember, that's what happened. Uh, anything else, Adam? Um, oh, I was, I was wondering, um, what was it like to work with Antonio Inoki? I really enjoyed it. I mean, I don't think anybody really understood what what was happening at that time. You know, I mean, you know, that was another case where, you know, I was told exactly what to do, so I went out and did what I was told to do. You know, he told me what to do, so I went out and did it. You know, he just told me to to wrestle him and hit him hard, and that's what I did. Um. You know, I mean, I, I, the thing that, you know, I came out and I thought, I don't think anybody had a clue what was going on, you know. But uh, Terry Funk was there at the time and, and he said, just give me the thumbs up. So that's exactly what he wanted. He did a great job, you know. So I was I was made up with that, you know. That was all the, you know, what I needed to hear because uh, I just did what I was told to do, you know. And it, it did me. It did me well for a, you know, a, quite a good run in Japan, it did, you know, for a few years there, so, I don't know, so, um, I really enjoyed it. How did how did you like? Um, I, I remember when you were in Japan, they uh, they had you with uh, Hashimoto a couple of times, and you had. Um, I remember one match, you just just well, I was talking to you, you were, you're both like drenched in sweat. I don't even know how long a match it was, but it just looked like. You know, like the fifteenth round of a of a of a boxing match, and you're yeah. throwing the forearms, and he's throwing the chops, and the sweat's flying everywhere. So I don't know if it was. I think it might have been in the summer or something, but maybe it wasn't. I just remember that that just popped into my head, and I thought it was like a really great match. Yeah, we had two like championship matches, and uh, you know they, they make everything so good over there. It was so special to me. Made it, you know, like you get in the ring and there's a Japanese flag and, and, and the Union Jack was flying, and, you know, they play your national anthems and, you know, it just make everything mean something, you know, and it, it was really good. And we, we worked real well together, me and him, we just clicked, you know, I'd seen the scene working with other guys and he, he wouldn't work with them, you know, he just wouldn't sell his stuff and he wouldn't do a lot of stuff. But he, me and him just seemed to click, you know, and we really worked well together. And we had two real good ones, and uh, we worked a lot of lot of stuff that wasn't taped or anything. But the two were really good. I remember that one. That was the first one I think that you saw. I think it was in the middle of the summer. We were just absolutely drenched, like we could beat the hell out of each other. You know, for a minute one of the matches, you know, and it was uh, it's one of those matches where you know we just built and built and built and just a lot of false finishes, and, you know. Just kicking out on two and a half, and people really got with it. So yeah, they were real good. Uh, this is someone who's asking about what you think of uh, Tony St. Clair, Johnny Smith, and we talked about Danny Collins. So Tony St. Clair and Johnny Smith. Tony St. Clair was a, a great guy. I only ever met Johnny once. Um, I was 17, and I went to to a Dale Martin show in England trying to get a job. And uh, he was just leaving to go to Calgary. I'm not sure if he'd been before, but, you know, I know he was going back there. And I just turned 18. No, oh, sorry, I was 18. I was 18. And he went the week after, and I got his jobs. They, they filled me into the jobs that he'd left behind. But uh, I've spoke to him on the phone a couple of times. I've been with Chris Benoit, and he called him. I've spoke to him a few times. Uh, I, I was watching him just recently on some old Japan tapes, and I, you know, he works real hard, you know. And you know, any guys from England that get on, you know, I love to see guys get on because it's a, you know, it's a hard, a hard place to come from. It's, it's a, you know, it's hard to get out of there and, and, and make a name for yourself elsewhere. And so he's done a good job of it. Tony Sinclair was just tremendous. It still is, you know. I mean, it's, 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 early 50s and he still works and he's still great he, he was just you know a class act what uh, about Chris it, Adams not a lot okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, not much to say on that point no. I, I don't class him as a he's, he's English but I don't class him as an English wrestler he doesn't wrestle English style he doesn't do anything English style you know I mean he, just, he never did when he was in England he certainly doesn't now you know I don't Um, we're pretty much running. We're pretty much running low on time right now. Just, well, we get one more thing here. This is from Toby Tyler, who says, uh, 
Uh, could you let Steve Regal know that his addressing people as sunshine was one of the highlights of a truly horrible year watching WCW, and that I hope you manage to sneak that line back into your promos when you get to the WWF? Yeah, I mean, that's something I call people anyway. You know, it's, it's just a lot of English people call people sunshine. It's just, you know, a thing that... It, it, it was funny because I guess, well, I guess you were doing the program with Sting then, yeah, and and some other people, and it was just it's it's like almost like a, from an American hearing a guy you know say that it's almost like you know he's trying to say he's like effeminate or something, which is a heel I thought was was pretty effective because you're kind of like you know he's supposed to be a superstar and you're kind of you know acting like you know like you're you know you think you're going to beat him like a girl or something. <laughs> I remember that slap I gave him across the face. I just remember that that one. Promo was sat in an office, like signing a contract, and I, I had to backhand him around. And, oh, rattled his face. It was brutal. You know, it's one of those things when you hit somebody and go, Oh, I wish they hadn't done that. That hard. It, uh, yeah, I remember that. People seem to. That's another thing people remember. You know, I haven't done that for since I was 96. And yet, silly things like that, people react to me a lot when I, you know, I see people at shows and I talk to a lot of people. I always bring that up. Along with the, the infamous song. <laughs> the song, yeah. The song. Brian, anything else before we let Steve go? I just want to say Steve is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And, I mean, I just love watching, I mean, all the wrestling that you put into a match. I mean, you don't see a lot of top wrist socks or even anything nowadays, but you always snuck it in there and it was awesome. Yeah, I, I always like that, that little subtle stuff, too, you know, where it's, uh, you know, the headlock again, when, I, when the guy had him in the head, I, I, when the guy had him in the headlock and he got out of it by stepping on the back of the leg and turning it an arm bar, it's awesome. Yeah, I, I always I always like that smooth. It's just like smooth stuff, and and since it's stuff that you don't see in this country, yeah, it it, it makes you you know, I mean, the, the the technical aspect of it, it's just something different, and I, I always enjoy it too. Well, thank you. you, know, it, it, that's what makes me different. You know, otherwise, it, you know, you've got to. To try and be different somehow, you know. I, I can't fly around. There's not a lot of stuff I can do, you know. But I, I always I, I learn all that stuff when I was younger. And it, it, I didn't really do a great deal of that as, as years got on. It, it when I was in Europe, you know. But when I came over here, I thought I've got to do something different. So I, you know, the, the the more I've got with that stuff, the more I think of other stuff, and the more I think about doing stuff and changing it up. And that, so, you know, that, that thanks for noticing a lot of that stuff. You know, I think a lot of it sometimes I'm just doing it for my own amusement. But, it, uh, it, you know, it, obviously people pay attention. That's good. Real, real quick before you go, one last thing. Where did you come up with the name Steve Rigor? Was it given to you? It was given to me um, when I first got the job for Dale Martins when I was 18. A guy, I, I'd had a different name every day for the three years previous, whatever they thought was the funniest name they could give me of the particular day. I was always like another match, you know, on the on the on the posters and stuff, so I never they just gave me whatever name they needed. And a a guy that I knew in England, he had a American wrestling magazine and he, he it was obviously the American Steve Regal and he said, There's a good name, Steve Regal. So they gave me that and I just kept, you know, after a while when you start travelling around and people get to know you by a certain name, you, you know, I, I never changed it because um, you know, that's what people knew me as, and so that, that was, I just kept it as that, you know. Okay. We've got to take, we got to take off right now. We're right at the deadline. I want to thank Steve and, of course, Brian for being here, and we'll be back here tomorrow at 6 with Eddie Guerrero.